Prima Media's Mining Weekly is speaking to Corey Diacher, the CEO of Hydrox Holdings, a company that has really shot the lights out in South Africa with the development of a world first in electrolysis. And we want to find out from Corey why he's been so obsessed with creating a solution for membraneless electrolysis to produce hydrogen. At a time when the world is going crazy about hydrogen, he's had this world breakthrough. Corey, can you give us some background on why you are so keen on creating membraneless hydrolysis? Thanks, uh, Martin. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yes, indeed. It, it's, it's, I think it's more of a passion. You know, I'm a very passionate person, and my passion is to turn the world green, to, to, do a, to make a contribution. What legacy do we leave behind? And when I, I got involved 20 years ago, with, with uh, friends of mine approached me and said, listen, they've got this product, you know, they can make hydrogen, and they can make it cheaply. But what they were doing actually was just pure electrolysis. They just take water, they took the water, they break it apart. They had this very dangerous, volatile mixture, hydrogen and oxygen in, in, in a gas, gaseous form. And, and, and that is the uh, where we started off. That's why the company's name is also Hydrox, combination of hydrogen and oxygen. We, we couldn't really uh, split it at that stage. We couldn't get it separate. And we started with experiments in this. It was very fascinating. We, we, we tried to run a car. This is the first thing. Can we run a car that can you know, derive its energy from water? So you take electricity, you put it into the system, into this electrolyzer, which was, by the way, a, 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 a swimming pool, a pool filter, a stainless steel filter. And they just put two electrodes in there. Actually, a, a very dangerous business. So please don't try that. Uh, and, and eventually, it's, it's a miracle that we didn't get blown up or whatever in, in the process. But we went to the university and said, all right, can we have a look at this? As a matter of fact, we installed this in a, in a vehicle and we drove the vehicle and we got some tremendous results, you know, but we couldn't ever make enough of this very volatile gas. We had to change the fuel management system. Uh, anyway, long story. Uh, eventually, we said, we can't go ahead with this. We have to separate the, the gases. That was advice from Ford's engineers in Silverton and Victoria. These guys said, it's nice you have this car, the Mazda Etude out there. We've got this unit inside that uh, added this volatile gas to a mixture of, of, of petrol and oxygen. And the only thing that we really achieved here is you could change the, the, the mixture of, of, of the fuel very much lower. Uh, where you had previously a 14 to 1 is a very economical car, 14 parts air, one part uh, petrol. We could bring it up to 25, 25 parts oxygen and then only uh, one part petrol with our uh, hydrogen mixture in between. But that was dangerous. So we had to stay clear, change the direction, and we did that. We started developing our own system. How can we get the hydrogen and oxygen separate to stay separate? Uh, if I can just give you a brief explanation, you have two electrodes, and then in between you put a membrane. This is a standard procedure all along to keep the oxygen and the hydrogen from migrating back. Because they have a tendency, once they're free, they want to migrate back. They don't want to stay separate. And this is the big challenge. Now, a, a membrane is, or a diaphragm is, is a very fancy piece of, like, a, can, can I say, a cloth kind of thing. It's made from polymers or whatever the case is. You get different kinds. Anyway, we, we started experimenting. We couldn't uh, afford the ones to import. We wanted to import from uh, Germany. We couldn't afford it at that stage. We started building our own. And we had some mixed results. As a matter of fact, we were very excited. We built our own, you know, and it worked. But the only problem is our electrodes were very far apart. It was about 12 and a half millimeters apart. So that's too much. So there was too much resistance. And we even had an expert here from the Imperial College of London, <coughs> Professor Anthony Kursenek, I can, is, is, is actually a wonderful scientist. He came along, he was blown away. He couldn't believe that in South Africa, we could, with our rudimentary system, we build a system that gives you hydrogen and oxygen separately. Only thing is, it was not economical. It was the distance between the electrodes were too far off. And he said, listen guys, Bring it closer together. You can't have a 12 and a half millimeter difference. It's, it's a distance. It's too big. Bring it closer together. Then you'll have something. And then, you know, the world will be prepared. And he gave us a lot of guidance. He gave us a 27-page report. It was wonderful of him. And, and we started from there. How can we bring them closer together? And this is where we started. And eventually, one of our engineers, he woke up one night and he had this brilliant, instead of, uh, you know, he's, I think it was uh, inspiration. I don't know where he got it from, but it's just amazing. And he said, instead of having the flow parallel to solid electrodes, let's make our electrodes perforated. Now, this, our electrodes now are perforated, and we've got no membrane or diaphragm in between. So the flow is now through these uh, two perforated electrodes, and only the flow separates the, 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 uh, the uh, gases from migrating or crossing over. 
And this is what's so simple about it. You know, we, we go to these international conventions and we've been to a number of them, and people say, wow, does it really work? Yes, it works. And, and we, you know, and this is where we've been fortunate, you know, and at one of these conventions, uh, Shell picked us up and he said, they're the engineers, and we, we had long conversations with them, and they said, okay, they prepared to, to sponsor us, and this was nice. So we build a five kilogram unit, which is actually complies to world standards. It's a wonderful unit. It works. It's functioning. It proves the principle. We've built the world's very first membraneless electrolyzer, meaning that there's absolutely no membrane between the two electrodes. And this creates a lot of opportunities for us, obviously. Now our big challenge is let's optimize it. Let's make it better. Let's improve it. Let's take it to be a real world class. The fact that we've, we've deviated from a, 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 um, a course that's been set 100 years ago, how to make hydrogen, this is a new direction altogether. And maybe I can just interrupt myself. At this stage, there, there's numerous scientists, clever guys over there, trying to, to go to the, the membraneless route for the simple reason, if you can take rid of, get rid of the membrane, you get rid of a lot of costs involved and a lot of other complications. The membrane also causes uh, some resistance. The membrane is also, uh, it can fail, and, and then you have crossover of gases. This is the kind of thing that it causes, is associated with membranes. Membranes can't handle, for example, high temperatures. The one thing they can't. They can't handle high uh, pressure. So these are all things associated, and they don't last all that long. So you've got to look at these things very objectively and say, all right, if you don't have it, that's an idle situation. But how can you accomplish this? And this is where we've been fortunate. So the first thing was, when we got to, uh, ice, uh, it was in Denmark, in Copenhagen in 2017, the first, uh, I think the miracle was that we got a patent. I mean, well, from South Africa, a patent on electrolysis, and believe me, there are thousands of patents on the same kind of subject. It is just a total miracle. We battled for years to get one, by the way. It was not that easy. We even had, I had personal conversations with the patent examiners in America itself, through the different patent uh, attorneys and all the layers and stuff, to explain to him. He couldn't believe that it's possible to make hydrogen without a membrane. Yeah, we succeeded in it. Well, this was, uh, and, and then the next thing was to get hold of Shell, and Shell reacted on this, and it took us a whole year of negotiations before they started really believing in us, and then giving us high milestones and say, right, you've got to do this, and then the next one, and the next one, before we will advance some more monies to you. We've, we've uh, ticked all that boxes. They're very excited about it. It's the first time that they've ever, uh, and from that, uh, from the Game Changer program, the Shell Energy, um, that they've ever uh, supported any company in Africa. So this is, a, I think, really a milestone for on its own. And, and now, you know, we've, we've achieved all their, their targets. So the targets were quite stiff. We had to achieve a certain uh, electricity consumption because that's a big thing about uh, hydrogen, and we can maybe talk about it a bit later. Um, to give you an example, um, if you look at, at, at why, uh, the question is why this passion? The passion is let's lower the cost of hydrogen. Let's make it more affordable. Then we'll open up this whole world. We'll see our logo. You can see it over here. It's, it's uh, you know, unlocking the future. Now, we want to unlock the future of green energy. Let's, let's use this. And, and if you look at electrolysis as such, there's two big components here. The one is obviously always the capital expenditure. And the other one is the operational expenditure. But the operational expenditure, the, the biggest cost there is electricity, is power. Power is about 70, 80% of all the cost is just the power consumption. And the tragedy of it all, Martin, is, is 40, 50% of that energy is wasted by means of, of heat. That's got to be uh, cooled down again, the system. So there's a lot of losses associated with electrolysis. Uh, and, and that's why we came in and we said, all right, let's address these things. But we, we, we're not going there very biased. We're going there with an open mind. We, we're just going for, with a whole new technique. Let's get rid of the membrane and all its associated parts, and let's make it simpler. And this is the secret to it. This is a very simple concept. It's so easy to understand. It's just the flow through these pipes and to take the hydrogen out of this side and that side, and then get rid of it through a normal filtration device. It's quite, quite simple. So there's nothing to it. So our, our basic cost is, is also very inexpensive. Uh, another thing we've used up to now is only um, uh, electrodes made from a just nickel, nothing fancy to it. We've tried some catalyst on top of that, not very successful because they didn't really last, our systems didn't work that well. Uh, we were, I think, to a certain extent naive. We're learning a lot, we've learned a lot over the couple of years, believe me. So I think <laughs> right now we know exactly what to do. But what's interesting is with this, just pure, basic, uh, straightforward electrodes, we, we've built a system that can match anything out there right now uh, on, on cons power consumption, 
and, 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 and um, it'll probably last for 20 years, whatever, we haven't tested that. The, the biggest problem that's keeping us back is, is the fact that we can't really test all these things in, at length. We don't have the funds for that, it's as simple as that. You know, you, you limit by your budget, you can only do this much, and we've got a very small team, a very dedicated, and I can say very, very clever guys, and, and they, they're driving this. And, and this is why we're very proud that we could now build a five kilogram industrial size unit. Well, not industrial size, but at least it's their experimental size. You can use it and it's five kilograms is probably enough for two or three houses, to provide energy for that. But the cost for that unit, again, back to the capital cost, it will be quite high because it's a one-off. You know, we've got to import everything from wherever in the world. Uh, we, we, there's, locally, we couldn't really get any assistance. We had to go and generate and get it from our own sources everywhere. So you import these things and then a valve blows and you've got to replace that. And this is an ongoing because you only got one. And then with the COVID thing and the restrictions, it was quite a challenge. But this thing is working. It's wonderful. It's there. And now we can do it, take that as the building block to go much further. And this is why I'm excited. So the one side, capital costs. Let's bring that down. Our system is mainly made from uh, polymers, pl uh, plastics. It's, it's purely plastics. Only the electrodes and the, in the, and the electricity side is, is, is made from metals, that's all. And we use inexpensive uh, metals at this stage. We're going to experiment in, in our own uh, limited experimentations before at one of the universities, and that was at uh, Northwest University. We were very pleased to, to work with the scientists over there and also uh, at some other universities. And currently we're working with UJ and also the, the uh, University of the Cape. And so it's, it's, very, uh, it's very nice to know that there are in fact a lot of potential here. If we start just adding a little bit of say uh, platinum, uh, we, we tried a splattering of about 9% mixture, only 9% platinum. And it's a tremendous improvement in, 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 in the uh, electrolytic performance of, of the system. Suddenly you get uh, much higher current densities this is what you want, you know, a small unit with high current densities that you can actually lower your capital costs further, make us build a smaller system and bring the cost down. That's on the capital side. On the operational side, again, the closer your electrodes can be, the higher the efficiency, the less power they will consume. And that's why we're excited about the whole process. So if, if we can use the high temperature instead of just wasting it away, and, and, and it's been proven that, you know, if you can go to 200 degrees Celsius, uh, because we don't have membranes, there's nothing that can, uh, you know, erode or just blow away or, you know, get, come apart because membranes can't really function or, you know, uh, diaphragms above 90 degrees. It's getting tricky because then they start falling apart. And, and, and also on the high pressure, because you put it under pressure not to boil the stuff, you, you want to get rid of the steam. You just want to, so at 200 degrees Celsius, we can, in fact, uh, get much better kinetics out of this thing. So what we can do, we can reduce them. This is our calculations. The electricity consumption from 60 kilowatts to about 40 kilowatts, making it really nearly 100% efficient. This is wonderful. So you can think what impact that can have on the system where your majority of your cost is, is electricity. So we can bring the electricity down by 20 or 30%. It's going to have a huge impact on the cost of the hydrogen. And if we can bring the cost of hydrogen down to a level of two or three dollars a kilogram, we will have a world winner here. We have entered into an agreement with the University of, of Iceland. They have a um, whole consortium of, of universities and some uh, uh, practical guys, uh, also in the industry over there from Denmark and Portugal uh, and all over where, where they want to push this. Our system can handle, for example, dirty water or contaminated water or acid mine water or seawater. There's no membranes to get clogged. So this again is a possibility, but it's still got to be exploited. It's still got to be taken to university, it's got to be studied because there are other effects here. If you have salt in the water, you will get chlorine on the side. You've got to look at that, also deal with it. And the chlorine is also, you know, will corrosive, will attack your, your anodes. We've got to look at what kind of anodes. And this is kind of, but this, these are the possibilities that, that membraneless technology is presenting. It's, it's opening the whole world to sort of a new, new avenues that can be explored and it's got to be done. And I think this is exciting, but for the short term, we want to get our five kilogram optimized. We're going to build a hundred kilogram unit now and then get that off to the market as quickly as possible. Because this again is our frustration. We want to have a product and say, here it is made in South Africa and it works or made under license. And we can solve a lot of issues locally. You know what, what, what the issues are with power generation and even in the mining. And uh, there, there's such a demand for hydrogen. I, you know, I, I can keep you busy for hours just on the demand for hydrogen and what you can do with it. But the secret is it must be affordable and it must be available.
And our idea is to give you decentralized plants where you want it and the hydrogen to be extremely competitive with diesel or petrol or whatever the case and no pollution involved. And if we can go to the renewable energy side, which is the exciting one, Currently, your renewable energies, I think, and I feel sorry for them, these guys have gone to the extent of building all these huge plants and the solar panels and the wind farms, and now all of a sudden the government does not take up the electricity. These are curtailed electricity. We can use it. We can take that into our system, but it doesn't work on a five kilogram. You've got to put that in a thousand kilogram a day system. And you can actually convert that spare energy or that wasted energy now into something usable, something that you can store in the form of compressed hydrogen. That's easy. That's not a big deal and oxygen. Bear in mind, every kilogram of hydrogen, eight kilograms of pure oxygen. Nobody ever talks about the oxygen, but we can give it to the hospitals for free, sort out their problems with you know, oxygen right now. So this is another big op opportunity, but and even for the people into the farming, uh, we've got inquiries from people from these farms or the hydroponics, they want oxygen and the hydrogen. So it's quite exciting. Hydrogen for power, oxygen for feedstock to put it into the water, whatever the case is, or the system. So there's a lot of possibilities here. And the music to my ears was that the platinum could act as a catalyst in a very efficient way. Amazing. It's just, you have like a 60% and even more increase. And interestingly, the higher the current, if you go from 1.7 to say 2 volts, it's not a sort of a parallel sort of, it's exponential. It's just amazing how big the, 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 high, uh, the, the platinum suddenly increases in, 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 in its uh, efficiency. It's just, wow, it's, it's just mind blowing. We really couldn't afford the platinum. I must say, when we tested, we had to do it in America and Maine, we send our electrodes over there and the guys plated it for us and send it back and the, the, it didn't really last. But even in that short spell of time, we've got the reports back. It's just amazing. Uh, you know, we got uh, over an amp uh, back, uh, 1,100 uh, milliamps per square centimeter, which is amazing. Normally you work at 200 milliamps. And, and, and we got a 1,100 milliamps per square centimeter back on the performance level from a little bit of platinum, not much. And this is what we got to look at. What is the optimum? And, and again, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the optimum, platinum is obviously expensive. So you got to look at what's the least you can use. And there's others also that associated the metals with platinum that, that can actually tie in very much. Molly Depnum is one, and, and there's a couple of others, not expensive, but they can all play a part. And even pure ferrum uh, iron as such can play a part, but it's got to be worked out and, and it's got to be experimented. And now we've got there, we know how to do it. We know how to get it to last, to stay there, and how to uh, you know, get it uh, attached to these uh, electrodes of us. And also we're looking at different kinds of electrodes now. We have more surface area. We've ordered them, it's on its way here. We can't wait for that to start. It's just amazing what we can do with our flow through systems now. And if we can get the catalyst on there, uh, boy, we're going to blow them away. It's, it's going to be mind boggling. And then we'll have efficiency second to none. We can build a small system. And the other one which is important, uh, Martin, is, is that we can utilize fluctuating currents. Currently, uh, no electrolyzer can do that. You know, we've tested from, uh, say, two, 200 milliamps to, to, to uh, 20,000 uh, milliamps, 20 amps per square centimeter, and we still get separation. Obviously, you won't go that high because then it's crazy. It'll break the system apart with all the shocking effects. But we can use the fluctuating currents in our system. And we've tested now, as part of our shell project now, we've tested that as well. So we can use, to a great extent, the fluctuating currents from renewables. So if you sit and the wind is blowing a lot, we can utilize it. We don't have to rectify to bring it to the same straight level. We, have to, we can actually use the fluctuating currents, which is exciting. Uh, and, and this is what we still have to do. Obviously, pragmatic, we've got to put it in a link it to a wind farm or a solar farm and see what it does. But on the, on the theory, we, we've tested it with the computers and you know, putting in the electricity and, and simulating um, the, these fluctuating currents, it works. And this is what's exciting. It's another possibility of our, uh, because we don't have the membranes. And, and this is the problem. They rupture because of all the extra bubbles and stuff like that. We just blow them away. Our bubbles travel a very short distance. And that's why it's nice. And I say the bubbles of the gases on this side and that side. And this is what's so exciting about our technology. It's so simple, but it works so well. It's got lots of potential. So yes, fluctuating currents, renewables, it's a great match. <laughs>